my name is Scott Cheney. I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, comparing Eurolift, Resume, and Holep. Um, first of all, I want to welcome everybody to Arizona. If you've never been here before, uh, this is a beautiful time of year. This is a picture up in Sedona. You can see the red rocks and the beautiful blue sky. As an outline for today, um, we're going to go over some background on BPH. We'll go over the procedures of doing Resume, Eurolift, and Holep and how they're done. We'll talk briefly about the AUA guideline statements again. Um, I know Dr. Parsons already uh, went into those in detail. We'll look at the level of evidence for each of these therapies, and we'll look at comparative outcomes. Uh, we're going to look at functional outcomes, sexual outcomes, complications, and the durability rate and retreatment rate for each of these. Um, finally, um, we'll talk a little bit about the decision-making process, uh, which is somewhat complicated with so many options. I have nothing to disclose. All right, so we'll go into a little bit of background on BPH uh, very briefly because I know we're very, very well versed in this. This is a picture of the Superstition Mountains, the foothills. Um, so BPH is incredibly common and incredibly prevalent in our society. 15 million men over the age of 30 um, have been affected by BPH. The Olmsted County study in 1993 looked at patients and the proportion of patients by different age groups who had moderate to severe LUTs, which they defined as an AUA score of greater than seven. You can see men in their 40s, about 25% of them are affected, and it increases in each decade of life until 70 to 79, when about 45 or 46% of patients are affected by BPH and severe symptoms. We're gonna go over some definitions. Um, again, there are a million options for treatment of BPH. Um, there are minimally invasive options and there are more aggressive options. So MIST, or minimally invasive surgical therapies, um, are included with Eurolift, which you'll also see referred to as prosthetic urethral lift, or PUL, and Resume, which is considered water vapor thermal therapy. I'm gonna use the short names just for simplicity, um, but those are uh, some of the definitions for minimally invasive surgical therapies. Um, Definitive therapy is tissue removal, and HOLEP is just one way of removing tissue and destroying tissue to open the channel. HOLEP stands for Holmium Laser Nucleation of the Prostate. So I want to make it clear to everybody that we're not comparing apples to apples. Um, these are different therapies that are called for in different situations, but they have different outcomes, and we'll look at some of the outcomes such as IPSS score, flow rate, and quality of life scores as well. So. Again, we all know the different treatment options. Um, I think, as Dr. Parsons was saying, we generally start with observation and less aggressive therapies. Patients can try, try dietary supplements, but they don't always work. We have medications, minimally invasive surgeries, and in, it, in addition to Resume and Eurolift, we have TUMT and TUNA. And again, TUNA, um, the recent AUA um, guidelines recommended against it. And then definitive therapy, and this is where um, it plays to the surgeon's expert level of expertise and what they recommend for patients. But you have TERPs, TUIPs, HOLAPs, PVPs, HOLEP, open simple prostatectomy, and robotic simple prostatectomy. So the first minimally invasive surgical therapy we'll talk about is Resume. Resume was FDA approved in 2015. It's made by Nuthera in Maple Grove, Minnesota. Uh, essentially, the device is, um, the procedure is done as an outpatient uh, in the typical setting. Uh, the patient will typically get 10 milligrams of Valium as well as intraurethral and intravesical lidocaine for about 20 minutes. The device is inserted through the urethra and it has this curved injector needle that has 12 emitter holes on it. It's injected uh, and placed into the lateral lobes of the prostate about one centimeter distal to the bladder neck and the treatment is uh, instilled. It basically creates steam vapor through radio frequency and that steam vapor travels into the tissue in between cells and causes instant cell death and a level, an area of necrosis about 1.5 to 2 centimeters. It doesn't cross collagen barriers, so you don't get transition between uh, the different zones of the prostate, and you also don't get thermal therapy outside of the capsule of the prostate because the collagen barriers prevent that. Typically, uh, four to five treatments are made in each patient, um, and you can see over here on the... Uh, right here, we have a pretreatment picture and a, and a six-month picture. This, uh, this pretreatment picture shows a patient with a very large median lobe that's acting like a ball valve. And you can see that with the treatment on the median lobe, um, this patient has a wide open urethra at six months out. Typically, uh, about one to two treatments are made on the median lobe when it is present. 
Eurolift is the next therapy. Uh, Eurolift was FDA approved in 2013, so we have a little bit more data on Eurolift. Um, as Dr. Parsons said, it's ideal for patients without a median lobe, um, but that's because that's what the original studies looked at, is patients with a prostate volume less than 80 grams and without a median lobe. Some studies lately have been showing that patients um, are having this done when they have a median lobe. But basically, the patient, um, similar to the resume, is brought into the office uh, in the outpatient setting, um, given oral anxiolytics and also intrauterine lidocaine um, and intravesical lidocaine. The device is used with a standard cystoscope and inserted into the urethra. Now, the prostatic urethra lies anteriorly within the mass of the prostate, so the device is placed at 10 and 2 o'clock, about 1.5 centimeters distal to the bladder neck. Um, it has... Uh, Basically, the implant has two tabs, one on each side. This one goes through the capsule of the prostate and buttresses the, uh, the suture. And this one goes inside the prostatic urethra. Now, the tensioning of the device is based on how far you angle the scope into the prostate tissue, and it will self-tension and tie off uh, appropriately. Um, typically, about four to six treatments are used um, in each patient. You can see here we have some pre-procedure and post-procedure pictures. And you can see there's some impressive um, uh, results here out after the surgery with a wide open urethra. And finally, HOLEP, um, and this is again a more definitive and more aggressive therapy. HOLEP was first described by Dr. Gilling in 1995. Um, it can be used for prostates of all sizes and configurations, but typically um, it is used for larger prostates. Um, in this procedure, uh, you basically go in with a scope, and I like to use the orange analogy when I'm explaining this to patients. I basically tell them that the prostate is like an orange with a straw going through the middle of it. And we're using the scope and the laser to thermally and bluntly dissect away the meat of the orange away from the peel of the orange, leaving the peel in place. All of the nucleated tissue um, is then pushed into the bladder and then morselated. You can see from this picture, this is um, two lateral lobes touching in the midline. And this is a picture of the enucleation. And you can see the capsule of the prostate right here on the left side, and the prostate adenoma on the right. And the tissue is being peeled away uh, gently from the capsule of the prostate. Um, again, briefly to go over the AUA guideline statements, specifically for our three treatments that we're talking about today. Um, Eurolift, again, also called PUL. Uh, it's an option for patients with a prostate volume less than 80 grams and absence of a median lobe, and they recommend that you talk to patients about the symptom reduction being less than that of when they have a TERP. And again, uh, it can also be offered to patients who are concerned with erectile and ejaculatory function. Very similar to this with the other minimally invasive surgical therapy is Resume. Again, offered to patients less than 80 grams, but you don't have the limitation of having the, um, without having the median lobe. And they recommend that you tell the patient that the efficacy and retreatment rates and the data on this remains limited. So we have data about three years out right now for Resume, but we don't know what's going to happen with those patients long term. Um, and again, um, Resume can be used in patients who are really concerned with erectile and ejaculatory function problems. And we'll go through some of the data on that later. So finally, HOLEP. Um, HOLEP can be, again, considered for patients with all prostate sizes, though generally the patients who come to me for a HOLEP um, have a prostate between 100 and 300 grams. Um, and HOLEP and PVP and THULEP are considered uh, standard of care when you're treating uh, patients with, with a higher risk of bleeding, such as people on anticoagulation. I typically prefer to do this uh, procedure off of any anticoagulation, but I have done it on Coumadin, aspirin, et cetera. I haven't tried it on, on Plavix yet. So what about the level of evidence for these therapies? Um, Eurolift and Resume have not been around for very long. Eurolift for five years, Resume for three years. And we only have two randomized trials for Eurolift and one randomized trial for Resume. Holup, um, it's been around for more than 20 years now, and we have 31 randomized trials. So we have a lot of data on the long-term outcomes of this. So let's look at some of the outcomes. Uh, this is a picture from the Grand Canyon uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, if you haven't been, I suggest you go. Um, let's look first at the IPSS scores. So we're, again, we're not comparing apples to apples. These are completely different studies, but I want to give everybody a good sense about the degree of improvement that you can get with each of these surgeries. So um, generally, the baseline IPSS score was similar between the three groups, uh, around 22 to 26. With Eurolift, 
the score was 22. At three months, they had an improvement of 11 points, 10 points at 12 months, and long-term, which was 60 months, was uh, minus eight points. With resume, you had similar results. 22 at baseline, minus 11 points uh, at three months, 12 points at 12 months, and 11 points at, at uh, three years. With HOLEP, you get um, a baseline score of 26, but you get a whopping improvement of 21 points. Um, and that lasts long term with 18 points uh, at seven years after surgery. Looking at the quality of life, so this is um, out of six points, it's the bottom question on the AUA symptom score. Um, around, the baseline was around the same for all of these. And you can see that long term, you get a, an improvement of around two points for resume and Eurolift and around three points for HOLEP. And the point of this is that all of these studies, you know, they have different, differing degrees of improvement, but they're long lasting and they're durable, even for these less invasive surgeries. And then finally, QMAX. So uh, with Eurolift, you can expect an improvement about, of about three to four milliliters per second on their flow rate. And this lasts out long term. With Resume, you had an improvement of 6.4 milliliters per second early on, but that diminished a little bit with time down to 3.5 milliliters per second uh, at three years. I think the data, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this data long term. And finally, with HOLEP, um, of course, you see durable results. Um, a baseline of eight, and it went up to plus 14 milliliters per second um, as you got out to seven years. So what about the sexual outcomes? We're all surgeons. We want to fix the problem. We want to we want to hammer the nail, we want to get the tissue out. But there's a lot of times where we ignore the sexual side effects, uh, especially the ejaculatory dysfunction, and we minimize that. But that's an important thing to certain patients. And so I think it's valuable to have some options that you can give to these patients who are really concerned with the ejaculatory function. So with Eurolift and Resume, we had no de novo erectile dysfunction. And we had very little ejaculatory dysfunction. It makes sense, you're not really destroying or removing um, very much tissue at all with these surgeries. With Resume, understandably, you had about 2% of patients that had uh, reduced ejaculatory volume, but that was it. And you have absolutely no difference in the um, IAF and MSHQ uh, ejacula ejaculatory dysfunction scores between the two. So that's in contrast to HOLEP. So HOLEP, we all know, if you take out all that tissue, there's not going to be a backstop for integrate ejaculation. So the rate of retrograde ejaculation is 74 to 85%. So that is translated into the um, orgasm score of the IIEF. They had a baseline of 8.5, and at one year, it went down to 6.5. But you get uh, persistent erectile function, and it's actually, it's very consistent, baseline of 22.3, and after a year after hole up, it was 23.8. And the overall satisfaction with, with intercourse, out of 10, a baseline of 7.2 and 7.1. So although their ejaculatory satisfaction went down, their overall satisfaction was the same with HOLEP. So looking at complications uh, after surgery, um, stress incontinence is one of the most feared complications after HOLEP. Um, it's not reported for with Eurolift or Resume. But with HOLEP, um, the studies have been very, very different. Um, they see a 1.3 to 44% chance of incontinence at three months after surgery and around a 1% chance of long-term incontinence. I quote my patients about a third of you will be leaking at three months after a hole up. And that's really um, important that you do your Kegel exercises to try to improve that. But long term, even in some of the most difficult patients with the largest prostates and older age, it is very, very rare that you have long term incontinence. Um, urgency, dysuria, um, those are all much more common in hole up than they are with Euro left and resume. The stricture rate is anywhere between 0.5 and 8.1%. Uh, for HOLEP, and it's not really reported at all um, as a complication for your left and resume. And the transfusion rate for all three of these surgeries is incredibly low. So what about the retreatment rate? Um, again, we don't have a ton of data on your left and resume, um, but there is some data out there. So the need to go back and do surgery after having a ural lift uh, for BPH symptom recurrence. So this is somebody who is in retention again, or they have symptoms, and the ural lift just didn't solve the problem. About 13.5% of those patients will have to have some kind of other surgery at five years out. You're also going to have complications from the implants. You get 7.1% of them that get encrusted and they get removed. Now, typically, the implant will epithelialize over um, by about six months after surgery, but occasionally in patients that doesn't happen. You have removal uh, of implants that go into the bladder, and I've seen this before for patients um, who had significant pelvic pain. 
the um, implant went through the prostatic wall and into the bladder. And you have 2.1% of total patients that have that removed. And then 11% of patients restarted an alpha blocker or a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor at five years. Now, just because they have had these symptom recurrences doesn't mean that you can't do something else. It just means that something else needs to be done. And I suggest that you let the patient know about that up front. Again, we don't have as much data for Resume, but they um, estimate at the three-year study that 4.4% of patients will need another surgery um, uh, after the Resume. At whole up, understandably, again, you're more invasive, so you're removing the tissue. There's a 0.5% chance of needing um, a repeat surgery for symptomatic uh, symptom return or residual adenoma. So special considerations. Patients ask me all the time, have you ever had a catheter in? And I, I proudly have not had to have a catheter in, but um, having, the, having a catheter in place is, uh, is a big deal for them, and that can be uh, an important thing. Um, you're left the, the average catheter length or length of time that the catheter was in was 0.9 days. For resume, it was 4.1 days. And for hole up, it was 18 hours. Typically, after a hole up, I try to get the catheter out on post operative day number one, whether I'm doing it inpatient or outpatient. Let's look at the learning curve. Well, resume and Eurolift are pretty simple procedures. You can learn them after five or 10, 10 procedures and master them. Hole up is the hardest thing that I've ever learned, um, and it took me about 60 cases to really master it. And that was in residency where I had a mentor watching my back at all times. So it's hard to adopt this, this procedure unless you have a fellowship or a residency in it. Um, so it's, it's definitely a, a barrier to widespread adoption of the procedure. And then finally, anesthesia. Um, again, Eurolift and Resume, you can do these under general anesthesia, but I would say that most people do these with local um, uh, anesthesia in the bladder and also oral anxiolytics. Holep, the only way to do it is with general anesthesia. And the mean operative time is 125 minutes. So for your older patient who can't have anesthesia, a holep is not the right option for them. So let's look at the cost. Um, this is one study, and unfortunately, they didn't include um, holep in this uh, evaluation, but you can extrapolate based on uh, TERP. So they basically looked and compared the cost of each of these procedures to the improvement in IPSS score at two years out. So where you want to be on this graph, you want to have a lower IPSS score, which is down here, and you want to be cheaper. So Resume um, was their, uh, their baseline comparator, and you had an improve, improvement to 10 on their IPSS score and a cost between $2,000 and $3,000. TERP and Greenlight were a little bit more expensive. Eurolift, um, the cost of the implants was uh, quite a bit more expensive, so you get the same improvement as Resume, but it cost more. And then, um, of course, as you can imagine, combo treatment uh, with medications um, gives you the least improvement and especially with branded, costs the most. So what about the decision-making process? Um, how do you help patients to make this decision? It's a really tough decision to make. So I made a graph here, and it basically plots the effectiveness of the surgery with the invasiveness of the surgery. The more effective you are, the more invasive you are. So first, let's compare the different variables between these three. So you can have some concrete numbers to tell patients what to expect. So let's look at the, flow, the peak flow rate. With medical therapy, you can expect the peak flow rate to improve to about 2.4%, and this is based on the combat trial. With minimally invasive surgical therapy, anywhere from 3.5 to 4 milliliters per second. And with HOLEP, or definitive therapy, um, you can expect the improvement to be 14 milliliters per second. So you get a much bigger bang for your buck with uh, the hole up in the invasive surgeries. Now what about the improvement in the IPSS score? We well, have 6.3 points uh, for medical therapy, 8 to 11 points for MIST, and 18 points for hole up. So those are the good things that, that shine for hole up. The, repeat, the need for repeat surgery or to go on to surgery with the medications is 12%. The need to go on to definitive surgery with MIST is 4.4 to 13.5 percent, and the retreatment rate with HOLEP was 0.5 percent. So you're not having to go back and retreat these patients. Then we look at the incontinence rate and the ejaculatory dysfunction. Um, I thought it was interesting that the ejaculatory dysfunction rate was much higher for medical therapy. Patients are complaining about, um, about these problems with finasteride and with uh, Flomax. And the rate of incontinence was 3 percent with these, these procedures. With MIST, the rate of incontinence was 0%, and ejaculatory dysfunction was 0 to 2%. And finally, this is where HOLEP tends to do worse than the others. You get an incontinence rate that's long-term around 1% um, that needs something else done, a sling or uh, artificial sphincter or something like that. 
Um, and the ejaculatory dysfunction rate is incredibly high, and that's mainly uh, retrograde ejaculation. So this is uh, a diagram from the recent AUA guideline, and basically they stratify the patients based on size, and I think that's why it's important to know the, the exact size of the prostate in your patients. For a small or average prostate, really you have all of the options that are available to you. But for a large prostate, really there's only a couple of options for you. Simple prostatectomy, whole up, through lip, and I would add on here robotic prostatectomy. For me personally, um, I tend to, for patients who have a smaller prostate, less than about 50 grams, I tend to recommend a TERP, a Urolift, or a Resume, and I basically go over all the results with them and let them decide. For prostates that are larger than 50 grams, um, I'm still willing to do a TERP and less invasive surgeries on them, but I try to stick, I try to steer them more towards doing a whole up because I think it's a more definitive option for long-term uh, outcomes. So in summary, um, you must weigh the efficacy, the invasiveness, the cost, and your skill set when you're choosing a surgery for these patients. Your lift and resume have similar efficacy, a low complication rate, and reasonable durability. And I would say also that they don't preclude doing other more definitive surgeries down the road if they fail. Your lift and, and resume preserve uh, sexual and ejaculatory dysfunction and they should be used for prostates less than 80 grams, although um, some studies and some people have been using them for larger glands. Holop has a higher efficacy rate, a lower retreatment rate, but it's more invasive and has more side effects. And a Holop can be used for any size prostate. It should be considered uh, for patients with a higher bleeding risk. So in conclusion, every urologist should have several surgical tools at his or her disposal to address the unique patient considerations. And you have to go over symptoms, anatomy, efficacy, comorbidities, and side effects. And that's it. Thank you.